As a kid, I loved the books of Jules Verne and the movies of Jacques Cousteau. Now, some years later, after I learned how to make, and co make robots and code um, their brains, I met another student who also loved the books of Jules Verne and the movies of Jacques Cousteau. And we decided to make a robot together, our version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. We call this robot Amour, which stood for Autonomous, Modular, Optical, Underwater Robot. But this robot was really about love. Amour moved beautifully in water, like an underwater helicopter. It took beautiful pictures, and it could transmit video right to your desktop. All of this enabled by some very innovative ideas. Now, one hot, hot, hot summer day off the coast of Singapore, we decided to see just how fast this robot could go. We were feeling very confident that day. And we took down several of the safety features of this robot <laughs> to give it more juice. And then off the robot went. So I should tell you that it had taken us three years to build this robot, and it was our only unit. So we waited and waited and waited. But Amour did not come back. We lost Amour, and we were devastated. Now, the thing about science is that the first instance of an invention takes a long time to make, but subsequent copies are easier because they benefit from prior knowledge. And it is also true that great failures teach great lessons. So we went back to the lab, we worked hard, we wrote some code, and after 60 days or so, we had three copies of an improved Amour. And we took these robots to the water. And as we watched them make flips, we started thinking that we really wanted more. And we started wondering, what would the children of Amour look like? Stronger, smoother, softer. Well, meet our robot fish, an underwater robot that can change the swimming direction in 100 milliseconds, which is on par with real fish. This is because these robots are, fi uh, are soft and they have dynamic tails. And with fish, it is called the escape maneuver because it allows fish to escape from bigger fish who want to eat them. So we took this robot to the ocean. There it is with its one big black eye. And there's me right next to it. We swam the, with the robot. We watched it glide elegantly by beautiful coral reefs. It saw fish, beautiful fish with its monocular vision. And it even found Nemo. <laughs> so it took us three years to make a moor three months to make three copies of Amour, and today we can make the soft robot fish in the lab in a few hours. This change of pace may sound familiar to you, because just two decades ago, computation was a task reserved for the few. Computers were large and expensive and hard to access. You really knew, you had to know what to do with them. But all that changed, and today everyone computes, because we all have smartphones. In fact, computation is so normal, we don't even notice how much we depend on it. And this raises an interesting question. In this world so changed by computation that helps us with thinking work, what might it look like with robots that can help us with physical work? How much work could we offload to machines? Autonomous driving will absolutely eliminate road fatalities. It will give our parents greater independence and quality of life in their retirement, and it will give all of us the ability to go anywhere, anytime. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. Imagine heading home from work in your autonomous car, knowing that it has the smarts to keep you safe and to make it fun. You stop at the grocery store to pick up supplies for dinner. You hand your uh, dinner menu to a robot at the door, the robot connects to your home, figures out which items you're missing, and a few minutes later, another robot hands you a box. You get home, you pass the box to your kitchen robot, and then you even let your children help with dinner because uh, you know that your vacuum cleaning robot will sweep up their mess. 
Now, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that this sounds like one of those cartoons about the future that never comes to pass. But in fact, this future is really not that far off. Today's robots are already our partners in domestic and industrial settings. They work side by side with surgeons in operating rooms and with workers in factories. They mow our lawns, they uh, vacuum clean our floors, they even milk our cows. And I believe that in a few years, they will touch many more aspects of our lives. But to get there, we need to solve a challenge. Today, making and using robots is reserved for the few, because it requires expertise that most people don't have. And specifically, a robot is made of a body and a brain. And few of us have the skills to make the body and code the brain. While there are tools available to help us with coding, we don't have tools available to help us with making. And this has to change. Now, for this change, we need to do three things. We need to advance the science of autonomy. We need to engineer tools that will help us with making. And we need to educate the young generation, our children, our students, in computational thinking and computational making. Because only then they will be prepared for a future with machines integrated into the fabric of life. So let me start with the science. In nature, organisms are made out of cells that combine to make, say, a snake or an ant. Can we imagine creating robotic cells that would compose to make different shape robots, uh, the best shapes suited for the task at hand? Maybe a snake robot to crawl through a tunnel or a three-handed manipulator for the factory floor. We can even imbue these robots with the ability to make themselves. So let's say your robot needs to access something that's high on a shelf. Well, the robot could reshuffle the cells to grow a long arm to reach on the shelf. So that's the idea. When the task changes, the, box, uh, the body can change too. Here is a simulation of a robot we call the dog couch because it transforms a dog into a couch. And what you see here is the computational substrate, the algorithms, the brain of this robot that tells each cell what to do. Now, we know how to code these brains, but we do not know how to make the unit cell at a scale that is um, comfortable, at a scale that will result in a comfortable thing to sit on. Are you asking yourselves, why would we need a dog couch? <laughs> okay, this is my daughter, Jackie. When she was five, she told me, when I can't sleep at night, I sit around and wish that I could pull toys in and out of the walls, or even better, cookies. <laughs> well, if we had the dog couch, we would have the tools to make Jackie her wall. And actually, I have worked with hundreds of children. The thing I love about them is that there are no rules that limit their imagination. Now, what if I told you that in the future, I could hand you a bag that has any tool you want in it? So in this conceptualization, I have a bag of smart sand that will make a copy of a wrench for you. And when you're done with it, you could return the wrench back to the bag, and the particles could be reused for a different task. Today, we do not have robot particles that can create the dog couch. But even at the larger scale that we have today, uh, we can do some interesting things. For instance, we can make um, self-configuring trusses and support beams. And this is an example using our robot called M-Block, which is about a two by two cube uh, that moves by pivoting. And the secret behind movement is a flywheel inside the robot that spins very fast. And then there is a braking mechanism that suddenly stops the motion, and the momentum propels the cube forward. We call it M-blocks because when we watch these robots, it seems to us that they move as though by magic, since there are no external moving parts. Now, to get from M-blocks, which is where we are today, to a world where we can have comfortable dog couches, we have to make these modules smaller and softer. We have to bring machines and materials closer together. We have to advance the science of making, which we are. But while we're doing this, 
we are also pursuing an alternative option. We are inspired by engineering to create tools that will automate design and also fabrication. If we had tools that would enable anybody to design and fab objects, we could have a world where you can make a robot on demand for any task. So here's Alice. We would love to automate many tasks in Alice's home. Let's say Alice wants a robot to play with her cat. So Alice could head to a store called 24-Hour Robot Manufacturing, where she could explore the design space using an intuitive interface. When she selects the final design, the store prints the robot, uh, the cost is affordable, and the cat has a playmate when Alice is at work. 24-hour robot manufacturing does not quite exist today, but it's coming. Today, the making tools are lacking. If we can automate the design and the fabrication of machines, we will get closer to a point where any one of us could make machines on demand. Let's say Alice might like a robot to play chess with her. What can the state of the arts today do? Well, a program could look at this requirement and identify what are the behaviors of this robot. Pick up a piece, move it from here to there, do not bump into other pieces. Once you have behaviors, another program could synthesize mechanisms that can implement those behaviors, generate some design files, assemble the components, and here is the robot that plays chess with you. Now, this robot was designed flat, and it was folded, following the principles of origami. This is why we call this approach to fabrication origami robots. Now, this particular robot was fabricated manually, but we also have uh, tools that enable us to create robots that make themselves. So here's a robot we call the Minibot. It starts at a as a flat piece of plastic, and when you put it on a heating pad, it grows into a full-fledged robot that can run at four body lengths a second, uh, it avoids obstacles, it can push things around, it can carry things, it can crawl on your body, it can even walk on water. And when you're done with it, you can send this robot to a recycling bin uh, where it could dissolve to uh, reuse the components. So, I don't know if you're aware, but every year we generate 50 million tons of waste. And electronics are particularly problematic because they cannot be recycled, and they're toxic when we deposit them in developing world countries. With this approach to making machines, we will not generate electronic waste. Now, we have tools for making these robots at large scales. But even at these small scales, they can do amazing things to contribute to our lives. And one option we're investigating is the possibility of using these robots as mini-surgeons. That you could swallow, they could perform some action in your body, a procedure, and when they're done with the procedure, they could be dissolved or eliminated. Imagine surgery without incisions, without pain, and without the risk of infection. The particular case study we're looking at uh, is uh, helping eliminate button batteries that people accidentally swallow. So every year in the United States, 3,500 people swallow button batteries. And this is dangerous because button batteries cause holes in the tissue, in fact, very fast, within an hour. So here's how the Minibot can help. You can package it in an ice pill, swallow it. When it gets to the stomach, the ice melts, the robot deploys, and uh, with the use of a magnet embedded in the robot, we can pick up the battery and eliminate it through the digestive system. And here is an example of, of how this would work in an artificial stomach. There is our ice pill. Uh, it gets controlled with an external magnetic field, much like an MRI machine. It connects to the battery, it pulls it out, and now the battery can be guided out. At this point, a second robot could arrive uh, to patch the wound and deliver medicine at the location of the wound. So these technologies can really do so many things. They can remove foreign objects, they can patch wounds, they can deliver medicine, they can take tissue samples, um, they can give us pictures of what our, the insides of our bodies look like. 
So we're advancing the science and we're advancing the engineering, and these are allowing us to begin to dream about a future where we can make robots for any tasks. But this requires that we know how to code and how to make. And the way I see it, those of us who know how to make things and then code them have superpowers, because we can imagine anything and we can just make it. And we would love to give our children the ability to have superpowers, the ability to turn their imagination into anything they want. So to do so, we have to teach them computational thinking and computational making. And this is really important. I'm not sure you're aware, but right now in our country, 6,000 students drop out of school every day. It's really a serious problem. And to address it, we could make education more interesting and more active, more engaged. Robots are magnetic to children. In fact, children love robots because they get empowered uh, at a time when they feel that the whole rest of the world controls them. So to help with this vision of uh, robots for education, we have created a new education platform we call the Robot Garden. This platform was created with the same tools we use to make origami robots. And this garden has hundreds of robot flowers, robot sheep, and even robot ducks in it. Okay. Children learn making by building the garden. And the garden can also be used to teach computational thinking. And here's an example uh, where the garden teaches a particular type of algorithm called breadth first search. Here, each robot is a vertex um, in a graph, and the color de denotes different stages of this breadth first search algorithm. Watching the garden is learning the algorithm. So we are developing the science of autonomy. We're developing engineering tools for coding. We're developing education tools for children. How might this help us with a future with robots? Well, the way I see it, today, if you can think it, you can write it. You can put it on paper because it is part of literacy. Now, imagine a world where if you can think it, you can make it. A world where Jackie could build her wall that stores toys. And another little girl who loves Jules Verne and Jacques Cousteau could create her own version of the underwater explorer. All of us can get superpowers by learning computational thinking and computational making. Each one of us can use our talents, our skills, our creativity, our problem-solving uh, skills to dream up new machines that can save lives, improve lives, help us go where we cannot physically go, entertain us, help us with physical tasks, and so much more. And we could even exchange our creations, much like we exchange computation on the App Store. In a future with robots, with democratized access to robots, the possibilities are endless. And that future is not that far off. And now I would like to leave you with a picture of all the students in my lab who have the superpowers to create the videos you have seen. Mm -hmm.